So let's talk about the Italian Jews and uh, why I selected to talk about the Italian Jews only because I'm leading a temple trip to Italy in June. <laughs> and uh, it's not the only reason. Um, so let's talk about this fascinating group of people. The history of Jews in Italy spans more than 2,000 years. Think about that, to the present. The Jews of Italy have roots dating back to the second century before the Common Era, when many Israelites under the leadership of Judas Maccabeus, the famous, you know, the, the guy from Hanukkah that we always sing about him, you know, left the land of Israel to go to the eternal city, Rome, and has continued despite of periods of obviously extreme persecution and expulsion until the present. Can you imagine, you know, Judas Maccabee walking towards, you know, Rome and singing, Sevi Fon, so, so, so. <laughs> anyway, approximately 10,000 Jews were transport, transported to Rome to help build the Colosseum. This image of history remains frozen in time, obviously, for those who've been in Italy when you see the Ark of Titus at the outside of, of uh, the old city. Although enslaved, the Jewish population in Rome flourished and many synagogues and numerous Jewish cemeteries were built. Now everything changed officially when the Roman Empire and the church, they declared that Christianity was the legal religion in the year 313. So it really depends, the, 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 the level of comfort of the Italian Jews really depend on the, you know, who was in charge. And uh, later in the Ottoman Empire, for many centuries, the rulers let the Jews live peacefully as well. But everything changed, obviously, in the year 1000, the Jews were banned for regular professions and were allowed only two positions, money lending and selling used clothing. In Italian provinces under the Aragon rule, this is in Spain, you know, under Sicily and Sardinia, Jews generally lived well until 1492, obviously, when King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella decided to expel the Jews from the Spanish kingdom, and many went from the south part of Italy to the north. By the second half of the 16th century, the Pope at the time instituted a decree that all the Jews were to be enclosed in ghettos and wear what is called a contrasenio, which was yellow, usually a yellow, a yellow identification something. In 1516, the world Jewish ghetto, the first one was established in Venice, and in 1555 in Rome. Ironically, although both were overcrowded and dirty, the study of Torah and Talmud flourished between their walls, resulting in the growth and enrichment rather than the destruction. And obviously everything changed with the arrival of Napoleon and the French army in 1797, where the Jews were granted equal rights and treated as first-class citizens. And in 1931, 1929 to be more precise, Mussolini came into power and you know everything changed for the Jewish people. They were sent into labor camps and some of them, about 7,000 of them, were sent to Auschwitz and perished during the Holocaust. What is interesting to mark also is that 3,000 Libyan Jews from Libya made Aliyah to Italy in the 1960s and 70s, and that, you know, made a little bit of the growth. So let's talk about the uh, Italian Jewish community in this day and age. So there are about 30,000 Jews in Italy, half of them live in Rome. So if you take a look here, you see at the bottom two pictures, two gorgeous synagogues. The one on the right is the Roman synagogue, okay, in Rome, and you can see clearly how the construction is very bright. The one on the left is the Sephardic Shul in Florence, and they are both magnificent. Um, if you come with me to Italy, you'll have a chance to visit both synagogues, and actually we can sing in those synagogues. Anyways, so there are smaller congregations in different um, areas of Italy. One is in Trieste, and we have one temple member, Daniel Segre, who is actually from there. So let's practice some Italian here. So the community umbrella organization is called Unione della Comunità Ebraica Italiane. Can we all repeat that? <laughs> Unione della Comunità Ebraica Italiane, Union of Italian Jewish Communities. 
2,000 years of experience and, and you know, creation of the Italian Jewish community has made something very, very unique and unusual. There are three types of minagim in Italy. The Ashkenazic, the traditional Sephardic, and what is called the Nusach Roma, or the Italian Rite. Okay? So, after Shabbat, don't do it during Shabbat, after Shabbat, you go in your cell phones or in computer and type service at the Tempo Maggiore in Roma, or the main synagogue of Rome, and you can see how different from all the things that we do here in the Sephardic and the Ashkenazic world that you can see over there but the beautiful things. No, I have to say this, I'm sorry. My wife is going to say that to me that I'm doing too many jokes, but you know, I like to say, I have to say this, I have to mention this. So, there are three kosher food restaurants in Rome, and the names are unbelievable. Taverna del Ghetto. Wow, the Ghetto Tavern, that's beautiful. Bella Carne Kosher Restaurant. Beautiful meat kosher restaurant. And the burger house is called Santa Maria del Pianto. Saint Mary of the, of the Tears. Can you believe it? I'm going to the kosher Saint Mary of the Tears. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Anyways, so let's talk about the musical traditions of Italy. So we have, the first musician we have to mention is Salomone Rossi. Salomone Rossi was an Italian Jewish violin player and composer, and for more than 40 years, he served as a court musician of the Dukes of Mantua. Guglielmo, Vincenzo, and Ferdinando. And those, you know, were from 1587 until 1628. So there are many things that are completely unusual about Solomone de Rossi. He was a very highly respectful court musician. And as I mentioned before, the Jewish people in those days have to wear like a yellow badge on their hands. He was excused to do that because he was highly respected by the dukes. And he always signed always signed as Salomone Rossi el Hebreo. Salomone Rossi, the Hebrew, the, the Jewish, you know, the Jewish person, that, that's remarkable. Now, he wrote in 1623, two years from now, it's going to be 400 years, he wrote Ashirim Asharli Shlomo, uh, the Song of Solomon. You may think that it's referring to Song of you know, King Solomon, but he was actually referring to himself, Salomone Rossi. All right, anyways, so written in the Baroque tradition, and why is this so important? This is the earliest known published music, Jewish music for cinema. $300 in eBay. Don't get near me, okay? <laughs> All right, so is the best known and is so important for anything that came later in terms of you know, Jewish music written for synagogue. The second scholar is Leo Levy. Leo Levy was born in Casale Monferrato and then emigrated to Israel. He wanted to collect all kind of different you know, music from the Italian Jews and he did it. He made a thousand recordings and he was able to combine, listen to this, 27 different liturgical traditions in Italy, 27. Okay? Wow. That's very... So, you know, just to have an idea, for example, the Sephardic Jews that live in Florence, if you follow the map, came from Spain after 1492. Now, the Jews on the other side came from the Balkans, from Yugoslavia, and they are both Sephardic, and they have completely different traditions. So you can name 27. Now, um, yeah, I have to hurry because we have lasagna, pizza, and pasta for Kiddush, so... <laughs> have to hurry up. Actually, it's only egg salad and tuna salad. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you only came for the kiddush, I'm sorry about that. So this is my last item. So this is something very interesting. One of the holidays that is coming up now is Purim. And dressing up costumes and masks aren't mentioning in the Book of Esther. There is no mention at all. There is no indication that anyone ever dressed up for Purim in the Mishnah, in the Talmud, or in the liturgy of the Gaonim. But the earliest reference to dressing up for Purim comes from a Talmud person, Calonimus ben Calonimus, in the 14th century. He had strong ties with Italian Jewry and learned the practice while living in Rome. So, and for Mascos Purim, we find that the first record is in the 15th century by the Paduan Rabbah, Judah meets. 
So it seems like a tradition originated in Italian Jews in the 14th century. So, three things I want you to take away from this talk this morning. One is that the Jewish people in Italy have been there for more than 2,000 years. The second is that the earliest ever source of Jewish music, printed Jewish music, comes from Italy, from Salomone Rossi. And the third one is that the costume of wearing masks and everything comes from the Italian Jews. So thank you and Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>